Hi, folks. I'm here with Jason Call running in the second congressional district in Washington state, and he is back to talk about his campaign. He's running once again for Congress. Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for uh, having me on the show, Mike. It's uh, really great to be back. Always glad to talk to you. I've got to ask. So I've been asking this question to everyone who cho chose to run for Congress twice. What made you want to do it? Because I would never want to run once, let alone twice. So this is a lot of work. It's probably exhausting. What made you do it? Uh, well, first of all, it is exhausting. I have almost no free time and I get almost no sleep. I've got teenagers. I work full time. Um, and then I'm trying to do and, and I'm also, you know, involved in a number of activist issues still because that's just my, you know, history over the last 30 years and now running a campaign again. But, you know, there's a few reasons. I would say first we did uh, really well the first time around. We got almost 35,000 votes uh, for what was essentially a no name campaign. Uh, we raised about $53,000 total. Um, and we got, you know, I, I, I want to say, you know, without having actually crunched the numbers, we, we got more bang for our buck in terms of votes than almost any other progressive uh, in the primary uh, running in 2020. Um, the, you know, Washington is a top two primary state. Uh, I think California, Washington, and maybe Louisiana, the only states that do this top two primary, which means, you know, I can be on the ballot next to the incumbent. So in all of the states that have a separate Democrat and Republican primary, you're going to end up with the top Democrat against the top Republican. And Democrats uh, will typically say in those situations, well, we want to keep the incumbent because the incumbent has already proven that they can beat the Republican. But in Washington or in California, we can actually push the Republican off the ballot. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I have enough humility and, and reality about the situation to say, I'm not going to beat Rick Larson uh, in the primary. But if I get that second spot, then the voters of this district get to have a policy conversation that for 20 years they have not been allowed to have. And that's really what this is about. Um, we're, we're at the confluence of, of multiple crises in this country, economic, um, uh, uh, certainly environmental, uh, health care. And, and, you know, we've got these corporate Democrats who are, you know, just they're performative on so many issues. Um, they're, they're in the tank for their corporate donors. I mean, Rick Larson is one of 53 Democrats whose majority corporate, corporate uh, PAC funded. He's deep in the pockets of the military industrial complex and the fossil fuel industry. And I think the voters of this district um, have voted for him, as have I. I mean, I've voted for him in the past because he's been the Democrat on the ballot and I'm not going to vote for a Republican, you know, but it's more like a Democrat by default vote rather than you know, really feeling like I'm voting for somebody who represents my my interests. So if we can have that policy conversation, um, you know, and force him into a debate on issues, I really think we can win this race because I think this is a progressive district. Yeah. And you have the experience now. You've been in activist circles. You've kind of tried to build up your credibility with uh, local uh, party officials and whatnot. Um, it feels like this time is different. Like, I feel like you have a better chance this time around. And I know that you feel the same way too. Explain what makes this race different and kind of what you learned uh, after running the first time. Um, well, you know, I, I, we have to, we have to make some better inroads into the local democratic party organization. I mean, I was, you know, Washington's second district is, uh, and, and I know that saying something like that is kind of anathema to a lot of the, the leftists out there, mm -hmm. but I want to talk about the reality of politics and what the electorate is like, because, you know, the, the left on social media is not the same as the electorate in your district. And I think a lot of times right. that gets confused. Um, so while I hold those values, those progressive values, I'm not going to take any corporate PAC money. You know, I'm going to stand up to Democratic Party leadership. The reality is that we do need support from Democratic Party organizations. So there are 14 local. I mean, we'll we'll know what happens with redistricting here in in another week, I think. Um, but there are 14 local uh, party Democratic Party organizations that are intersectional with um, the the second congressional district. We got five counties. We got nine legislative districts. All of those organizations endorse, and so when those endorsements come through, and we got seven out of fourteen last time around, um, I think people were very surprised that one we got as many endorsements as we did, uh, but two that we we ended up getting as many votes as we did. My name was at the bottom of the ballot of eight. 
Um, Rick Larson has 20 years of name recognition, and we still got within 1% of the primary vote for being on the ballot. So I think that these local Democratic Party organizations, even though they know I am challenging the establishment of the Democratic Party, there are enough people within those organizations that recognize that we have to do better than the status quo. And I think that's really what gives um, us a good boost now is we've had Biden in office for 10 months. And what have we seen? We've seen Democrats fighting with Democrats and not getting the policies passed that we need to get passed. And I got to tell you, the incumbent that I'm running against, although he mouths the words, I'm a progressive, I'm grassroots. The fact is his voting history is extremely conservative. We actually went through the American Conservative Union, which is the, which is the, the premier Republican slash conservative um, organization in the country. They're the people that host CPAC every year. And they have rankings of their Democrats in terms of, you know, have they voted in alignment with the way we would have wanted people to vote? Well, over his 20 year career history, Rick Larson comes out about the 36th most conservative Democrat out of what we got 230 in Congress. He's the 36th most conservative. Uh, he's like, what is that? 84th percentile, I think it worked out to in terms of his voting history alignment with the American Conservative Union. And I don't think that the voters in this district, one, they're not aware of that, but two, that's not their values. So when we're talking about voters in this district voting their values, I am far more aligned with the actual Democratic Party stated platform than the incumbent is. Yeah, I, I like that you express the importance of really building up relationships with local organizations, even the Democratic Party locally, because that is how you kind of win them over. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are sacrificing your principles. And for people who followed you over the years, uh, there's no way anyone could say that you're like some establishment sellout. You are a true fighter. And one thing that I like about you is that if you were to be elected, uh, I know that you would actually be a real fighter. So I wanted to ask you about that. Um, in terms of the squad and progressives, um, can you share your thoughts on the Build Back Better slash so-called bipartisan infrastructure negotiations and what you would have done differently? Because there's a lot of people who have different thoughts about this, but I think that just like based on what I've seen collectively, leftists are disappointed with most of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would say, first of all, I would have been one of those uh, uh, people, the squad, and you notice that it's all the members of the squad who voted no on that. I would have been with right. them. I, I really want to, you know, this is another thing about, about left-wing social media and sort of the reality of politics, and there's been a lot of sniping at the squad, and I get it. I mean, AOC has said some things that I do not like, things that I would not say, Um and I would challenge her on those things, but in sort of a big picture way, she's one of the people who stood up and voted no on this because one, we know that conservative Democrats are not negotiating in, in, in good faith. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So when, when we look about, uh, talk about Pramila Jayapal as leader of the Progressive Caucus, I want to be careful because, you know, I don't want to act like I'm trying to take her down a peg or not, but I'm disappointed in her leadership, you know? And, and I'm disappointed with the Progressive Caucus as a whole. There are something like 95 members of um, the Progressive Caucus. And if you look through that list, you know, there's a lot of crossover with the new Democrats. Well, the new Democrats are a, are a free trade co coalition, you know, and that's what I'm running against. I mean, Rick Larson is a member of the new Democrats. He's chair of the Aviation Committee and Transportation, and he's been a career member of the House Armed Services Committee, majority funded by corporate PACs, takes a ton of military industrial complex and fossil fuel industry. Now he's claiming in his emails that he's a grassroots progressive. He's not part of the progressive PAC, but take somebody like Adam Smith, who is chair of armed services and who was a member of the new Democrats coalition. Why are they letting these people into the progressive caucus? It muddies the waters on what progressive means. So um, I'm glad that the six stood up to the Build Back Better. The Build Back Better is wholly insufficient to the needs of the time. The climate provisions in there alone are 7% of the military budget taken taken annually. And I don't understand how, uh, how Pramila Jayapal can get out there and talk about the Build Back Better Act being transformative. You know, it wasn't even transformative at three and a half trillion. It was transformative at the 10 trillion it started and maybe the six trillion that it, ended, it got cut down to. But once you start knocking it down to three and a half trillion and then take it down, it's not transformative after that. And um, yeah. if 
know uh, journalist Ryan Cooper. Ryan Cooper um, actually wrote a, a really good article um, about the insufficiency of the climate provisions and saying, you know, putting an insufficient amount with not a great plan towards climate is actually worse than just tanking the whole thing right now, going back to the drawing board and saying, this is what we need and this is what we're going to stand firm on. So that's my problem. I mean, we get this bill back better. I've said this for, for months now. We get this insufficient bill passed. And the next time that we go to try and get better climate provisions, we're going to have the majority conservative, uh, you know, we're going to have the Republicans and the conservative Democrats coming at us and saying, we already did climate. What are you talking about? Why are you coming back at us for more climate money? We already did climate. We already did health care. We already did infrastructure. And, and, and that is the real danger of passing something that's insufficient is like, where do we go from here? Because they're not going to want to, they're going to want, not going to want to do any more. Yeah. Um, uh, on that note, I wanted to ask you basically about something that you would have crucial insight into. This might be an online life thing, but one thing that has concerned me is um, – kind of this disillusionment with electoralism among the left for good reason. I mean, we had India Walton lose, Nina Turner lose, and then I see a lot of dissatisfaction with the way that the squad, not necessarily the squad, but the Progressive Caucus, more broadly speaking, handled Build Back Better. Uh, and one thing that has concerned me is that this is going to suppress you know, support for new leftists running for Congress, such as yourself. Now, I think that probably that's mostly online and people in your district don't follow this as closely and you can kind of cue me in on that but at the same time i haven't really seen that on my channel every week i'll talk to a new progressive running for congress and there's been a lot of enthusiasm and i didn't think that that would be the case maybe more enthusiasm than in 2020 um so what are you seeing like are are people feeling dissatisfied or is this kind of just in our own online you know echo chamber talk to me through I, this. I, I think um you know, yeah, again, what happens online and what happens in, in, in the reality of the elect electorate are not always the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that there is more lack of enthusiasm for electoralism online than there is in the general public. But I mean, let's face it. I mean, voter turnout was in the in the midterms was abysmal. Um, yeah. I actually went out to uh, Cleveland for 10 days to help with Nina Turner's campaign. The last 10 days of her race, I was on the ground there knocking doors in Cleveland for her. And in the end, they had something like 16, 17 percent turnout in this special election. Uh, that's that's abysmal. I mean, if you, if you think about it, Nina Turner got about the same number of votes as I did in my first run. Well, I had 13 percent of the electorate. She was almost 45 percent of the electorate with with her votes. I mean, just as a comparison of turnout in the Cleveland area uh, compared to here in Washington. But in this last election, just the the midterms, the the, the what is it, the off the off season, right? The, the, <laughs> right. The, between between the congressional and the presidential, right? You've got your off. We had, you know, like 25 percent turnout. That's just generally bad. I think yeah. it will be better in 2022. Um, but but I, I do I do worry that a lot of the people who I need for my uh, for my success, that is young people, you know, people who are who are in the 18 to 29 range where my policies are going to be the ones that are working best for their future. Um, I need to convince them that I'm worth paying attention to and that I'm worth showing up for. If I can get that segment, which only voted from what I can tell in terms of eligible voters ver versus who actually voted. I mean, it was under 10% of that age group actually voted in wow. the most recent November elections. I've got to increase that turnout. Now, the 65 and over, they vote better than 50% every time. Um, and so it's, it's a conundrum where you say, you know, we could win this thing if we had the turnout you know, from the younger populations um, and then trying to trying to sort of play that off with, well, we keep showing up for these people and then they don't turn around and show up for us. And so I think that's what we're going back to. Like if the progressives aren't fighting as hard for us as we have elected them to do, what is the point of showing up? 
And so yeah. where I think we are right now is I think the people who are running in 2022 as a, and ran last year in 2020, as opposed to the vote to the ones who got elected in 2018, the current squad, I think we're coming in with sort of a different recognition of how hard we need to fight when we actually get to Congress. So people ask me about the whole force the vote issue. One, I didn't think force the vote was great strategy. Um, I, I, I think it was kind of cobbled together very quickly and then blew up into this online thing of you've got to do this. I was like, I don't see any of the squad uh, voting against Nancy Pelosi right now. But if you want to know where I would be on that issue, I wouldn't vote for Nancy Pelosi just on principle, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what people are looking for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's a lot that needs to be fixed right now. I mean, we, we know the policies. I think that all of my viewers, uh, they're familiar with you enough to know that you have a great platform. But what I wanted to talk about is the barriers that are stopping us from actually getting what we need um, accomplished. And this this is really big picture. It's it's difficult, but I mean, out of all the things, I think we need institutional reform. You know, I would stack the Supreme Court, abolish the Senate or turn it into some ceremonial institution. Um, we yep. need electoral reform. I think that first past the post, you know, winner take all, this, this two party system is absolutely not helping us get adequate representation. I think we need campaign finance reform because basically what it comes down to is if you have more money, most times you're going to win. What would be the main thing that you focus on if you had to prioritize one of these really broad institutional changes? Because I think that all of them are needed, but I just don't know which one to focus on first. I kind of yeah, lean towards I, campaign I, finance, but. It, it is. And I've, I've said this a long time when people say, what are my top three issues? Okay. So Medicare for all and the green new deal, those are top issues. But when my third issue, and it's really the all encompassing issue is campaign finance reform. Yeah. Um, we have got to get corporate money out of politics. Um, my, the incumbent I'm running against raises a million dollars, you know, and he doesn't, he doesn't even have to call these, these, you know, he doesn't even have to call Boeing up. Boeing, Amazon, you know, Lockheed Martin, they're going to be dropping money in his coffers because they know they're going to get something for it in return. Mm. I'm not seeking out corporate PAC money, um, you know, and they wouldn't donate to me anyway because they know that I'm highly oppositional to corporate control of our government. But that really is the issue. Uh, we have these, these um, you know, we've got Citizens United. Uh, that is a tough nut to crack. Uh, but expanding the Supreme Court, stacking the Supreme Court would would immediately uh, we'd be able to one secure, um, you know, any assaults on Roe versus Wade. But we also be able to overturn Citizens United. So the dark money is an issue. And it's interesting because the Democrats, even the my opponent, uh, talks about how terrible Citizens United is. But he benefits hugely from it. You know, yep. I mean, that's that's just a reality. So, again, it's mouthing the words without actually um really being invested in changing that policy. Uh, but campaign finance reform, we have not seen a campaign finance reform bill since uh, since McCain-Feingold back in 1992, I think it was, 30 years without anybody bringing anything about campaign finance reform to the table. And I think that that's something that the Progressive Caucus should be doing. And even if it won't pass, and this is the same for anything, this is the same for Medicare for all, even if it won't pass, you keep bringing it to the table and you keep focusing attention on it, you know, because I think this country, Republican, Democrat alike, the rank and file voters know we've got a ton of corruption in Washington, D.C. The easiest way to get rid of it is just to ban those corporate PAC contributions outright. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's important. And I feel like unless we get campaign finance reform and get money out of politics, you're not really going to have an easy time passing anything. I mean, we're seeing it in action right now, trying to push through that with Build Back Better. And it's just being gutted. Um, at the time that I'm filming this, there's a Newsweek article uh, about how Manchin is uh, considering not voting for Build Back Better, shocker, uh, because of inflation. When we know that that's not the case, we know that he is taking money from the fossil fuel industry. Kirsten Sinema, same thing. She was against you know, the pharmaceutical uh, negotiation provision in Build Back Better, and it's because she's being bankrolled by big pharma. So I feel like unless you really change the system itself, you're not going to get meaningful legislation. You'll kind of see nibbling around the edges from time to time, but these things can be e easily undone with a new administration via executive order. And it, it's just, it's really frustrating. Um, well, so it's and, nice. And, Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Ma Manchin, and, Manchin and Cinema are kind of like the poster children for this corporate corruption. But mm -hmm. what, what I think what a lot of rank and file Democrats don't understand is they are providing cover for your shitty rep. <laughs> 
you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. My, my Washington state senators, Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell, are both deep in the pot. I mean, Patty Murray's taken a million dollars from pharma over her career. They both voted in 2017, along with Cory Booker and, you know, a, a dozen other de- Senate Democrats to ban the reimportation of drugs from Canada. This was yep. where Bernie was saying, I can take my people up to Canada and we can go get cheap drugs right across the border. Why is it that we can't have it coming the other way? Well, we've got Democrats. It's not just mansion and cinema you know we we've got an identified cadre of really conservative democrats like you know tom carper and chris coons in delaware uh maggie maggie hussein in new hampshire um but uh where is that is that maggie hussein Jeannie sheehan anyway they're they're all the same (laughs) they're identified as being conservative but if you look at the senate How many actual progressive champions do we have in the Senate at all? We've got Bernie Sanders. We occasionally have Elizabeth Warren, depending upon what the issue is. And we've got nobody else. Right. So we've got we've got 48 Democrats who I don't think we can count on at all. But Manchin and Cinema are providing cover for a lot of them. And I think that's what Democrat, you know, the Democratic rank and file need to wake up for up to and it's the same thing they're they're providing cover for democrats in the house so the democrats in the house can vote for build back better and they can say yeah we're pushing biden's agenda knowing that mansion and cinema are going to tank it in the senate so you know Mm -hmm. you know that i I mean that's why it's important like even the six that we have in the squad and we need to expand that they've got to be voting against these bills and then going to the public and explaining exactly why they voted against them and I think that's a problem with progressives. They don't talk to the public enough about why they're making the votes that they're making. Yeah, uh, and you're kind of touching on a really important thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and that is marketing. I think that as right as we are on the policies, because we have facts and data on our side, we're not good at convincing people of that. And maybe it's because you know the left doesn't have big money to get that message out more effectively. Uh, we've been successful at Medicare for All. I've, I've convinced many people in my personal life to support Medicare for All. But overall, I think that if I can make a constructive critique of the left, it's that we suck at marketing. We don't know how to sell our message. And that's something that extends to Democrats as well. Uh, what do you think we're like, what's a constructive criticism of the left overall that you would make that you think we should really be more introspective about and possibly change areas of opportunity if we want to be polite? Now, when you say the left, are we talking about the online activist left? Or are we talking about the pro- progressives in Congress left? Uh, I brought in that out. I'd say all of the left. Um Overall, like if there's this underlying issue that the progressive in Congress uh, deal with and the online left uh, grassroots activists, if there's one thing that kind of we're all weak at specifically, what do you think that is? Because I do think marketing is probably the answer that I'd go with. I, I would I would say the other thing, the other thing and marketing is terrible and Democrats are terrible at messaging in general. They always have been. Um, but I would say for the people who are left of the Democratic Party, um, I, I would say, you know, as anathema as this might be, because a lot of people want to push for third parties. Uh, we are not in a third party system uh, and mm-hmm. we won't be until we get changes in our voting uh, and yes. we get ranked choice voting um, and and people can vote sort of outside of this fear voting where like, oh, I want to make sure I'm voting for the Democrat who's going to beat the Republican rather than, you know, let's let's vote for the one that we all really want to support. Um, I, I would say to get involved in your local Democratic Party. Um, I, I ran a push uh, and I, it's, it's horrible for me. I feel badly saying that because I know uh, what a shit show the Democratic Party is yeah. because I've engaged with the Democratic Party for the last 30 years. But the reason the left does not get any traction within the Democratic Party is because people are like, I'm just not going to engage with them. They're, they're mm-hmm. terrible. They're corrupt. So I can hold two thoughts in my head at once. Yes, the Democratic Party is terrible. It's corrupt. Yes, if enough of us get in there. Who, who are willing to fight the system, we could actually take it over and we can make a difference in terms of endorsing progressive candidates and making sure that we're, we're raising money for those progressive candidates. We have in Washington a very progressive platform at the state level, and I know because I helped write it when I was a member of the Washington State Democrat Central Committee, right? But we cannot get 
progressive candidates elected unless we're willing to have those people on the ground in their districts within the Democratic Party, you know, voting for those endorsements, making sure that people are getting elected to the to the state committee who are progressive, making sure that the state party itself is you know, has a progressive chair and a progressive executive board. All of those things are within reach. If the people who are just like, no, no, get away, would say, okay, I'm going to give this a try. It's going to take sustained effort, right? Are you willing to commit to this to two years, four years, six years, six years, and see how it plays out? That would be the thing. That would be my message. You know, hate the Democratic Party, get involved with the Democratic Party. Uh, and, and because that's what's on the table. That's re the reality of what is on the table right now. Jill Stein pulled 0.7% in 2016. And I don't even remember what the numbers were for um, the Green Party in, two, in, in, in 2020. I don't think it was even that. So this mm -hmm. idea that we can push third party right now with our voting constraints, I just don't think it's realistic. But I can go to every state and look at their sort of platform, their rules, regulations, and bylaws, and I can say, here's how it can happen. I mean, in Washington State, it would be hugely easy. It's just a matter of getting the bodies to do it. Yeah, I think it's really important that you say that, because when we think about taking over the Democratic Party, people think about how difficult that is nationally with, you know, the National Democratic Party. But um, at the state level, at the local level, it is different. You can make a difference. Um, I'm hearing an echo. I'm not sure if you can hear that, too. I'll just I'll just push through. Basically, what I wanted to say is that, like, I hate the Democratic Party and I don't like the two party system. Um, and that's why I've been pushing for years to have people try to support H.R. 4000, um, which is a bill that would actually move us towards proportional representation. And for me, yeah, like I was a supporter of Jill Stein in 2016. And it was because I thought that, you know, if we have this opportunity right now with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and I live in a safe blue state, there's nothing, you know, to there's there's no risk in trying to get the Greens to 5 percent to see if they could get federal funding. Funding, But it's, the reality is that people just are not going to go for that. So we can't just by sheer force of will get a third party to a viable state. Uh, we have to get electoral reform first. And that's what I really want progressives and leftists to acknowledge. So I'm glad that you said that because you know you can you can try to take over your own state's Democratic Party and enact electoral reform in your state to make third parties viable, to change the system, but it's tough and yep. it's a really com complex and complicated endeavor. I studied electoral institutions in grad school. And even if you change the system and you think it's gonna yield multiple parties, sometimes it doesn't. There are examples of this in, in Japan, for example. Uh, but you know, I, I think well, that just- I, I mean, look Look at what happened in in the main Senate race. I mean, how many millions of dollars did did the Democratic Party uh, dump into Sarah Gideon's race? So even though Maine had uh, ranked choice voting, we still could not overcome the sheer volume of corporate money that Democrats threw at Sarah Gideon. Um, yep. And, you know, what did Betsy Sweet get? She got I mean, it was less than 10 percent. I mean. You know, so mm -hmm. so it's it's ranked choice voting in conjunction with getting rid of corporate money in in conjunction with, uh, you know, pulling the Democratic Party to to be a more progressive part uh, party. But, you know, I I would say that for somebody like myself, if I were to get elected or I should say when I get elected, you know, it will be a goal of mine to make it easy, <laughs> easier for third parties to establish themselves. I'm, you yeah. know, I grew up in, in England um, and I and I am used to, you know, I grew up being used to, you know, multi-party representation as they have through most of Europe, where people feel like they can vote for somebody that that actually represents them and then you have to do some coalition building to get to get um to get um uh, any let any real legislation passed but what we have here in the united states with two corporate owned parties is anytime you get something that's bipartisan the only reason it's bipartisan is because the corporations that are backing both parties are agreeing on it so bipartisan in america is a dirty word in my opinion because yeah. it means it means the general public is getting screwed and our system right now is so fundamentally broken that I feel like even if uh, we somehow got a third or a fourth party, 
that would just be corrupted by capitalism as well. We saw what big money did to the Democratic Party, which was once, you know, a party of the working people. So I feel like what right. you're saying here, this message of getting involved is really important because even if you kind of feel hopeless, which I think a lot of people feel right now, getting involved locally, it really does make a meaningful difference um, in your in your life. Um, so, uh, you know, I feel like most of my viewers are already on board. So now I want you to tell us how do we help you get elected? Because we need you in Congress desperately. Uh, do you need uh, phone bankers? Do you need canvassers, donations? Tell us what you need because we need you. Right now, right now, I need money. I mean, okay. progressive fundraising is is terrible. Uh, and and most of the time that I, that I spend on my campaign right now is calling phone lists uh, of people who are, you know, maybe progressive and maybe have donated in the past. You know, we've got these, you know, phone lists that are that all the candidates have and basically we're out there trying to sell our message for people who we think might give us some money and sometimes it works but most of the time i'm leaving voice messages and 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 so so fundraising is is really a struggle but you know i need staff uh i need printed materials um i i've got a guy i mean i'm hoping to raise two thousand dollars like in the next week or so so that i can hire a guy because one of the one of the things with progressive campaigns is uh unless we are fundraising we can't pay staff um and i don't want as a, as a labor guy and as a union guy i don't want people working for me for free you know so we're running on it we're running on a skeleton crew right now because we can't afford to pay more people but everything honestly everything starts with money and i'm not talking about the million dollars that rick larson has taken in you know, I'm talking like, can we get to a couple hundred thousand dollars? Um, if we can get to a couple hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in fundraising, I'll be able to pay the people to do the work for me, to pay the materials, to keep our tech going. Uh, like I said, I got two thousand dollars I want to raise in the next week or so so that I can hire a guy who's going to do some Facebook ads for me, some targeted Facebook ads for me. But that but, but I'm not going to ask him to do the work and then say, oh, I can't pay you on the back end or whatever. So, I mean, that's that's really what it comes down to. It's going to be fundraising, 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 you know, and we're not until we can do that we can't really get out on the streets and hit the district um and i'm hoping we can do that by january but you know i hate to say it man money 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 yeah yeah i mean uh, i don't think it's a surprise to any of my viewers you know it's yeah. nine times out of ten if you have money you win you know if you if you raise more money than your opponent you end up winning so absolutely i i don't think that that's shocking at all well jason thank you so much running in washington's second congressional district we're absolutely. absolutely rooting for you and of course we'll be in touch i'm sure callforcongress.com and all my socials are call for congress for not the number four mike it's been a pleasure talking with you again um and uh hopefully we we end up with some good news when the primary rolls around in august um one of the things that i wanted to say just as a, just as a quick wrap up here is i personally i'm donating five dollars a month to 10 different candidates they're all progressive candidates and if every progressive could just take 50 bucks spread it out between 10 people, you know, we're all running on shoestring budgets right now. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one way to approach the fundraising game is, is pick your 10 favorites, give them five bucks a month. You know, honestly, if every, if everybody who was following me on Twitter, uh, was willing to do that, progressive candidates would be funding, would be funded. I like that. That's a really great idea, actually. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Jason. All right. Take care, Mike.